All right, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to uh, this week's Grand Round series. Uh, just uh, some housekeeping before we get started. We have our CME code in the top right, uh, so please mark that down or enter it if uh, you need to get continuing medical education credit. Today we'd like to welcome Dr. Farshad Forizande as our speaker. Dr. Forizande is an assistant professor of medicine and cardiology at Case Western Reserve University School of Medicine, University Hospitals Cleveland Medical Center. Dr. Forizande started his education at Tehran University of Medical Sciences, earning his medical degree there. He then went on to earn a PhD in experimental medicine at the University of British Columbia in Vancouver. He continued his training with a residency in internal medicine at Houston Methodist Hospital in Houston, Texas, followed by cardiology and interventional cardiology fellowship at Emory University in Atlanta, Georgia. He has been on staff at UH as an interventional cardiologist since 2017. Dr. Forizande is the author of over, set, over 80 peer-reviewed articles, abstracts, and presentations on both translational and clinical aspects of medicine and cardiology. He's received numerous prestigious awards, including an AHA postdoctoral fellowship and many top presentation and research competition awards at local, national, and interventional, international uh, meetings as well. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Forizande. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for the introduction. So what I thought to do today is to get you a little bit out of the, uh, all the COVID thinking and go back to the real life in cat lab and uh, tell you a little bit more about the behind the scene actions um, in the catheterization laboratory. Hopefully that will keep the interest of people who want to do interventional cardiology in the future. And also for the residents who may not want to do that, at least they know what happens when they send the patient to the cardiac catheterization laboratory. So you're a good doctor thinking about what's the best for your patient, decide to send the patient to the cath lab. So what I'm going to do is to review uh, very briefly some of the evolutionary actually things. I think we owe it to the people who really have done this uh, in coronary interventions. And then I'll review uh, some of the aspects of coronary physiology and also intervascular imaging that we do nowadays almost routinely uh, for many patients when they come to the cath lab, which is a new thing compared to what it used to be done in catheterization laboratories uh, back in um, old days. And then throughout this presentation, um, you will get familiar, uh, more familiar with the contemporary techniques and the concepts that we use nowadays in the cat lab. So Andre Grunzik actually started the whole field uh, back in uh, 1977, um, basically in Zurich. He um, made his very first uh, balloon angioplasty on his own uh, kitchen table back then using his own, uh, you know, materials at home, and, uh, you know, hopefully he just used uh, the wine to sterilize the uh, equipment, but, you know, from the bottle you can say maybe he was enjoying himself too, you know, it was a laborious thing to do. So uh, after actually uh, doing this in, um, in some dogs, basically, he was able to get a poster presentation, an American Heart Association presentation back in 1975, you know. Uh, that's kind of interesting. And in about two years, he did the very first human, uh, basically, case. So back in days, as you can appreciate, there's a proxy LAD, very tight lesion here, and the only treatment that was available uh, was basically coronary artery bypass grafting, but somehow he was able to get this patient um, consented uh, to get the angioplasty done. And uh, so as you can see, he basically got a really nice... Uh, Acute result uh, when he did the balloon angioplasty, uh, but so after uh, can I minimize this? So after about 10 years, this patient ended up coming to the cat lab and um, had another angiography done, and uh, still actually the vessel was patent. Of course, unfortunately, Andre himself was not alive to do his second catheterization. Uh, back in 1985, he had a hobby of, um, you know, having his own um, uh, small jet, and then he ended up actually crashing in 85 and died early age, uh, but he basically started the whole field. So the main issue with the angioplasty alone, um, and that's why we don't do it basically uh, routinely nowadays, almost uh, rarely actually we do it, is that um, the acute closure rate is pretty high. So even back days, um, I know some of our uh, more senior attending told us uh, sometimes when they did the angioplasty, they were just waiting for the uh, pager to go off that, that they need to come back to the hospital overnight 
to basically salvage the patient again with another angioplasty or sent for bypass. So it was pretty actually high, up to 5 to 10% at least. And that's the whole reason that the stents actually uh, got into play. First with bare metal stents, the palmas shots actually stent, they were very uh, popular. But the main issue with bare metal stents was the re stenosis rate that was very high. Um, after, you know, a few months, uh, 20 to 50% of them, they had re stenosis And that's how we got to the drug eluting era where we had different type of medications, um, usually, you know, some sort of uh, cell inhibitory actually medication like paclitaxel, cerebellus being uh, released from a polymer of different type uh, on a backbone of uh, the metal stent. And that's how the first generation of stents, the prototype was the taxis stent and also cipher. Also, there was another type, Endeavor stent. These three actually came and uh, really decreased the chance of re-stenosis uh, by a whole lot. So this is an example of a uh, basically taxis stent that was used, and after seven years, the steel artery is nice and open. And when they <clears throat> did their study comparing the taxis stent versus bare metal stent, the rate of target lesion um, revascularization was almost actually half by using the drug eluting stent. But still, the first generation of drug eluting stents had the issue of late um, and very late, meaning more than one year thrombosis. And um, that's how actually people thought about how to improve the stent, uh, basically, uh, strategies and uh, uh, manufacturing. Uh, and that's how we got to the current most uh, second generation and some revision of this nowadays. You know, we use uh, Science Sierra, uh, Promise is uh, also used. The Resolute Onyx stents is a more contemporary one that we use. And this, they have actually thinner struts. They have, uh, you know, um, more friendly, basically, polymers. Uh, but they are actually excreting kind of similar type of medication. But the still people are not, you know, 100% happy. So they, um, basically, technology is still is evolving. They are trying to have thinner strut stents. People are trying to have bioabsorbable, actually, polymers eliminate the polymer and also eliminate the stent and how that's the idea of having bioabsorbable um, vascular scaffolds, BVS, uh, the prototype being absorbed actually came to the market and I mean initially came uh, with the clinical trial uh, went on and the idea was that, you know, you place the stent, this is the stent strut for with the BVS and after, you know, five years uh, there was no evidence of it and these are the pictures of the optical coherent tomography, OCT, that we'll talk a little bit toward the end of the session, and uh, basically a scaffold is gone after a few years. So this was very promising, but unfortunately when they did the large clinical trial after four years, the, and compared to the Zions, which was the a standard basic drug eluting extent, one of the uh, a standard ones, uh, didn't do very well in clinical trial, mostly because the rate of device thrombosis uh, was basically almost four times higher in this bioabsorbable stents compared to the um, second generation drug eluting stents. And that's why actually we don't use them now contemporary in the CAT lab, but that's not the end of the story for bioabsorbable stents. There are multiple uh, basically clinical trials, multiple companies working on uh, now second generation of bioabsorbable drug eluting stents, uh, bioabsorbable stents uh, and hopefully, you know, maybe in the near future we can have some of these. And again, the notion is to get rid of the metal so it goes away, so, so the vasomotion of the artery comes back and uh, you have less foreign body uh, basically uh, staying in the patient's uh, vessel. So stay tuned for this. I guess this is something to, uh, that we may see coming back. Let me present you with a case that, you know, I had about maybe a couple of years ago now um, when I was on a STEMI call. So a 66-year-old gentleman, and that will highlight some of the concepts we do in contemporary catheterization laboratories. So a 66-year-old gentleman uh, came in with crushing chest pain to one of our freestanding EDs. His past medical history was only pertinent for thymoma. He had rejection for that done. Uh, he has geared, very active guy, no smoking, no illicit drug use, you know, playing tennis regularly, no home meds, really good for his age. And this was his presenting EKG, and as you can uh, appreciate here in inferior leads, there's, you know, at least one millimeter ST elevation, so code STEMI basically was activated based on this. And, you know, having this opportunity and having interest in, you know, STEMI and ACS, let me just
quickly review with um, you in terms of the uh, diagnosis criteria for a STEMI. So if, you know, the criteria, and I always tell that when I'm doing CIC rounds here now, I think all the residents should hopefully remember this. You know, you need only one millimeter, a steel elevation basically in two contiguous leads, and, um, you know, it can be two and three, it can be three and AVF, uh, except for V2 and V3. So you need two millimeters in V2 and V3 uh, for ST elevation and my diagnosis. There's a little bit of caveat if you want to be more precise, and that is if uh, the patient is female for V2 and V3, one and a half millimeter is sufficient. And if the patient is younger than 40 years old, V2 and V3, 2.5 millimeter is the cutoff. Uh, but, you know, trying to make it simple, uh, I would say one millimeter across the board, except for V2 and V3, two millimeters. So that is the definition for a C elevation MI diagnosis based on EKG. And um, anyway, so we had this patient with inferior MI, got to the CAT lab. Our approach, you know, as default is uh, to go through wrist, radial approach. But this patient was almost shocky, you know, low blood pressure, uh, so, you know, uh, very faint radial pulse. So we had that basically to go through his groin. And as you can see, I put the micropuncture uh, wire here. It has this curly curve in the iliac artery. So it was a kind of a challenge basically to go through that. But anyway, we got the first shot, you know, with the inferior MI, you think of RCA being the culprit. But again, as a good um, default uh, kind of uh, uh, protocol, we try to look at the non-culprit arteries first to see what's going on there before we deal with the culprit artery to see the gravity of the situation. So in this basically caudal shot, you see this is the LAD. In the proximal LAD, the LAD, there's some disease, you know, maybe 75, 80%. There's some disease in the OM. And uh, you can appreciate probably more disease in, uh, in mid-LAD and also in the diagonal branch and some here in the LAD also. So there's, you know, multiple, you know, lesions in the left system. None of them, of course, are culprit for this presentation of the patient, but things to be considered. And this is the OM lesion in this areocaudal view. You can appreciate it better. And this is the culprit lesion in the RCA. So the contrast comes up, down, and then uh, almost the dis uh, mid to distal RCA, nothing goes through. You expect to have RCA coming all the way here. So this was his culprit lesion. So now we have this patient. He became bradycardic. bradycardic so I put a temporary pacemaker um, uh, through transvenous uh, access femorally. Um, and I took a picture of the groin. This is the iliac artery. It's supposed to be a straightforward going up. And now he has these basically two bends. So kind of challenging. And now with the pacemaker in place and some you know, pressure, I was able to get his blood pressure back a little bit. So I went up through his wrist. And basically two pictures, uh, this is the guide catheter, so it's a different type of catheter that we do the intervention through, basically. And then I put a wire down the artery. These wires are uh, 0.014, uh, basically, uh, inch in diameter, so very, very tiny art, uh, wires. And then we advance balloon through those and then balloon the artery here, give lots of medication, vasodilator, as much as the patient blood pressure can tolerate to basically open up the microcirculation and reduce the amount of distal embolization. So you see the artery is coming back. Again, one of the more challenging cases here. And then I basically um, went to his LV, uh, and, so, and, and you can see LV is not very happy. You know, he's functioning very poorly, especially the inferior wall is not uh, moving very well. So I decided to put the impella, you know, to support uh, the patient while actually we are doing this. So now we have the impella in place, you know, the uh, blood flow in the RCA came back with plain uh, old balloon angioplasty or POBA. If you hear POBA, that means plain old balloon angioplasty, something that Andre Gronzig actually invented back in the 70s. So I didn't put a stent here. At this point, patient blood pressure got better. He became a little bit more st um, stabilized. So now, actually, I took a pause. I was like, you know, this patient has this disease in RCA, lots of disease in left system, some of them involving osteal LAD. So really, this is a patient that uh, ideally, if you can <clears throat> basically get um, coronary artery bypass grafting, he will get a better uh, long-term result than play, uh, putting basically multiple, multiple stents. So that's why actually we uh, quickly did, you know, calculation of the syntax score, which tells you the uh, gravity of the complexity of the coronary artery disease. Anything above 32 and above would consider to be basically high, uh, and uh, he was 34. And then with the heart team approach, so we target a couple of uh, cardiac surgeons and uh, the interventional cardiologists. So all of us agreed that 
this patient long-term results basically with uh, cabbage would be you know, better than uh, PCI. So that's what actually we did for this patient. He received cabbage, he got a, a left internal mammary artery to LAD, SVG21, to SVG2 to distal RCA, two softness grafts, basically. He did very well post basically procedure, extubated quickly, his EF normalized. I've been seeing him now almost, as I said, two years. He's doing fantastic. He just comes every, almost every six months to say hi to me. But again, uh, this is kind of a, probably a more you know, challenging STEMI cases that uh, we deal with. And again, in this case, with the heart team approach, we decided bypass would be the better option, although 99% of the time, a patient is present with a stem, we just stand the culprit artery in the cat lab and then uh, decide what to do with the rest in a more staged fashion. But this was a more unusual case. And we you know, take into account what's the frailty of the patient if they have severe um, aortic stenosis as a concomitant disease, that will play some role in uh, deciding which route of revascularization is best for the patient, what are the bleeding risks, what's the candidacy for dual and better therapy, basically. If the patient has diabetes, there's you know, trials, um, freedom trials showing you know, um, they may actually do better uh, with uh, bypass surgery. Of course, patient preference, very important. You know, uh, we try to get that uh, into account. And of course, what are the availabilities in each center? So having said that, you know, I want to highlight some of the things that we kind of talked in this case in terms of contemporary uh, cat lab techniques. And one of them, which I'm a big uh, fan of, is radial first. Meaning, you know, as much as you can, I think you should try to do your catheterization radially, and these are the reasons. So, you know, back in old days, you know, the only option was femoral approach. You know, you would have uh, used your landmark, bony landmarks, you know, feel the pulse, and try to go basically in the femoral artery above the bifurcation. In, um, you basically stick the common femoral artery. Nowadays, of course, we use in fluoroscopy guidance if uh, you're a good interventional cardiologist, I would say you will try to be liberate at least and use a Walter sound sample, use it all the time, uh, or you can use it more selectively, but either way, and um, using micropuncture technique. So this actually, this is a micropuncture needle, uh, which basically is a 21 gauge basically needle compared to a cook needle, more kind of old fashioned needle, that you see the gush of blood coming out when you stick the artery, this is an 18 gauge, and maybe, are people that may say, oh, there's not much difference, you know, needle is needle, but there's a huge difference. So between the micropuncture and the standard needle, which is called cook needle, there's about almost six-fold more bleeding if you go basically with the cook needle. But also more importantly than that, the blood that comes out just because of your stick is that with the micropuncture, you know, you stick the artery, this is the micropuncture, you put a micropuncture sheet, which are small four-french sheets, and take an angiogram, if you like your stick size, and it is an appropriate stick, and uh, you like it, you take it, you do your procedures through that, you upsize the sheet, and you, know, you do a nice, safe procedure. But if you don't like it, this is a time that you can safely remove the sheet and keep uh, some manual pressure for probably four or five minutes, and usually this actually gets hemostasis really nicely, and then you can re-stick. But if you have used a cook needle and put a bigger sheet, um, that's, you know, uh, very difficult, if not impossible, to do because then you have to deal with a large, uh, larger hole, and um, that actually increases a lot of complication. So again, co talking about contemporary 2020 cat lab, I think radial first, uh, but also if you have to go for all micropuncture, ultrasound guidance, all that are actually uh, very important. You know, with the femoral approach, usually we obtain manual uh, compression. You know, almost. Um, 20 minutes for six French sheet uh, to obtain hemostasis. Um, and, but, you know, manual uh, pressure can cause several actual problems. You know, one of them is not very uncommon, vagal reactions. People, you know, drop their blood pressure, become dizzy, drop the heart rate, you have to give atropine. You know, all those bad things can be associated. And, of course, sometimes you get, you know, not the best actually hemostasis and some hematoma. And you can cause pseudoaneurysm. So these are all the things with uh, femoral approach, and this is a list of all the complications that can happen with femoral approach. And people are saying, you know, we are careful, but, you know, even careful uh, sometimes is not enough. Um, so two to 10 percent of time you can get uh, complications with femoral approach, the most common being hematoma, and the most deadly is retroperitoneal bleed, which is a nightmare for anybody working in cath lab. 
people are saying, you know, we use closure device to get hemostasis for formal approach, and, you know, that makes it safer, but the studies are not proving that uh, you can basically achieve early ambulation of the patient, early hemostasis, but there is no evidence in literature to say that the closure device will decrease the complication rate. Let's be clear on that. So that's why we advocate for a radial approach, you know, um, much basically nicer, safer approach for the patient. And um, so you just, you know, fill the pulse in a radial artery, you know, and there's an ulnar artery on the other side that basically feeds the hand. So even if there's, eh, in very rare occasions, there's a problem with radial artery, the ulnar artery will still supply good blood to the hand, so you shouldn't have a problem. And then at the end of the procedure, we put this is a wristband, there are different brands, this is a TR band it's called, but there are multiple brands with some air basically um, here, and uh, that will compress the site. But we obtain patent hemostasis, meaning that this to this air, uh, basically the TR band, there's a still some uh, pulse from the radial artery, uh, so it's called patent hemostasis. So we decrease the rate of radial artery occlusion. And also we give cocktail of medication, including heparin and vasodilators, when we get access radially, so the radial artery doesn't get uh, spasm and uh, thrombosis. And after the procedure, rather than the patient laying flat, you know, they can chat and can sit up. And more importantly, they can eat really quickly. After the sedation is off, uh, they can eat. You know, the patient, they love it. You know, rather than uh, being flat for another four hours, they were in pure overnight. Probably, you know, they have been waiting all day to get to the cat lab. And again, this is, uh, you know, uh, has been associated with decreased risk of bleeding. And uh, these are all the advantages, you know, of the radial approach. Really the big disadvantage, which I can see, you know, is a steep learning curve. You know, when you go radial approach, uh, in femoral approach, this is the catheter coming up. You have one area of resistance just based on anatomy. In the radial approach, which we go usually from the right radial, left radial is, you know, you have to hunch over the patient. It's, you know, bad for your back, and it's not that easy to do sometimes. But the radial approach from the right, you have two areas of resistance. So especially if the patient has some tortuosity, there's a little bit of a... Uh, twisting and tweaking and troubleshooting sometimes you have to do. So there's some learning care. But, again, I've seen many people, even more senior, uh, basically, interventionists that learn this. And so it's totally doable. It just takes a little bit of a practice and learning. But also it helps with same-day discharge and economic perspective. You know, um, you know, nowadays in medicine we talk about value, basically, in medicine, value healthcare, meaning that we get a good health outcome with a minimal cost. And definitely radial approach, again, multiple studies, including this one showing it will decrease the cost uh, of the care for the patient after PCI. And again, very importantly, patient satisfaction is going to be higher. I mean, what else do you want? Patient satisfaction is higher. They get, you know, less bleeding problem, less cost, same-day discharge. And more importantly, there are basically randomized clinical trials are meta-analysis showing mortality benefit, especially in the setting of a STEMI. Radial approach has been clearly to show basically mortality benefit, and um, so that's why the AHA put this recommendation that especially in the ACS situation, you should consider um, basically going for the radial approach as the default. And bleeding is not something minimal. It can associate with mortality, so just the hematoma means that, you know, higher risk of uh, mortality. So it's not that benign of a finding. People would say, you know, last year, you know, Actually, I was at ACC when they presented this Safari STEMI trial where they actually had all commerce STEMIs in um, large basic, basically centers randomized to femoral versus radial approach. And um, they found that, you know, in their hands, basically radial approach and femoral approach didn't have much difference in terms of the 30 day um, uh, primary outcome, which was all cause mortality. But having said that, you know, there are several caveats to this study. First of all, it was done in centers that the operators were very familiar and facile in doing both uh, femoral and radial approach, and they did meticulous, basically, techniques for femoral approach. They used micropuncture. They used ultrasound. It was a meticulously done femoral approach, and, uh, again, all of them were good radialists, too, because uh, the patient could be randomized to either. But having said that, you know, even if we accept the results of Safari as it is with no interpretation and you put it in the context of the other trials that have been done in the field, uh, still the pendulum actually is in favor of radial approach. And again, this was just for the mortality, and that's the only aspect, but again, the same day discharge, cost, patient satisfaction, all those things should be taken into account 
And so I would say just do it in terms of a radial approach. So now changing gear, you know, talking about the coronary physiology, FFR and IFR, fractional flow reserve and instantaneous flow reserve that you are hearing more nowadays uh, when you see the cat lab reports. I'm trying to make it more practical so as a resident, if you look at the cat lab report, you are not that unfamiliar with what that, uh, these things mean and you can interpret it. So when to do coronary physiology, and again, this is a sub-category of coronary physiology. In, in the morning, we had a patient in the CIC talking about endothelial dysfunction. So this is not to look at endothelial dysfunction. That's a total different thing, but, and that's more on the research side. We don't do it routinely in clinical scenarios, but this is clinically relevant, and we do it almost every day in cat lab. And if you have an intermediate lesion that you don't know if hemodynamically is causing significant ischemia or not, this is something you should definitely do. And there are important uh, concepts. So the lesion length is also very important to make the lesion hemodynamically significant or not, but also how much that actually vessel is supplying in terms of the amount of myocardium it's supplying. So, um, you know, I was giving this example in the morning as well. So if you have an LAD, proximal LAD lesion of 40%, the chances of that having a positive FFR, meaning uh, causing hemodynamically significant, basically, uh, ischemia is much higher than if you have a 40%, let's say, OM1, optus marginal 1, a branch of circumflex, or diagonal branch, 40% disease. More likely, those, basically, arteries will have negative FFR or IFR or both, uh, but in the LAD, even a 40% lesion, especially proximally, more likely will have positive uh, FFR or IFR and because they su supply more my myocardium. A small myocardium territories, again, uh, may not actually have positive, and that's why you should do the test. You know, you can't predict 100%. That's why you do the test. Otherwise, there was no reason to do it. In uh, infarcted territories, the, you know, this physiological testing it will tell you how much viability is in the tissue. So if you have basically positive FFR, that means that still there's a, a struggling myocardium asking for more blood uh, so that, you know, you have more reason to um, basically continue on with your revascularization. And uh, taking into account that FFR is a continuum. I know uh, there's a cutoff of 0 0.8 for FFR, 0 0.89 for IFR that we'll talk a little bit more about, uh, but it is a continuum. So it is not like if the patient has like FFR 0.81, that means there's no ischemia, we're good to go, everything is fine, we're happy. Or if they have 0.79, you have to extend. You have to take into account the patient clinical scenario when you are making decision. And those cutoffs were basically used, this is the definition for FFR, you know, mean distal coronary artery pressure versus aortic pressure. So those cutoffs were used to perform clinical trials. In the first trial that they actually worked on FFR, defer study, uh, they used 0.75 as the cutoff uh, basically for FFR. Um, and uh, basically they showed the patients who had FFR more than uh, 0 .07, 0 0.75 they could be safely deferred uh, in terms of PCI and treated medically, and they did just fine. And in the famous study, and this is the basically uh, numbers for that, in the famous study, which was the consequent uh, basically FFR study, uh, they used 0 0.8 as their cutoff, and again, they, they showed that um, FFR-guided PCI was not inferior to angiographically only uh, guided PCI. So, you can defer by basically more cases and not put the medal if they really don't need to. And another important message that sometimes people they may not pay enough attention is by doing FFR, you can really know for sure if the patient has one vessel disease, two vessel disease, three vessel disease, and many, many times you may actually change your perspective. You know, you have lesion 60% here, 40% there, 70% there, and you do FFR, the lesion that may look 70% may have a negative FFR, and the lesion that has a 50% may have positive FFR. Again, based on where the lesion is located, how much myocardium they're supplying. So that really changes your extended strategy or revascularization strategy. IFR, instantaneous flow reserve, is basically um, a, is a calculation. So when, if you look at the difference in terms of the uh, pressure in the cardiac cycle, there's a very free period during diastole where there's no basically changes in, you know, the pressure is not going up and down. So uh, in terms of the distal pressure and proximal pressure, there's not much um, basically alteration. 
if you find that wave free period, which is based on calculation, as I said, um, you can actually use that as your tool for physiological testing. And there are studies that they compared FFR and IFR, uh, the main one defined FLIR, uh, and they showed that if you have a IFR of more than 0.89, uh, that correlates with FFR more than 0.8, so you can defer the PCI based on that. And it was, um, again, subsequently um, uh, proved to be true in another study, uh, Sweden actually heart study. So that's why now in CAT lab, uh, we try, when we want to do physiological study, uh, start with IFR and um, uh, take it from there. And the reason is actually there are several advantages to do IFR alone. One of them is adenosine that we use to cause vasodilation, uh, basically to take the microcirculation out of the calculation. To basically uh, obtain FFR, it can cause bronchospasm, it can cause heart block. You know, there are patients, especially with COPD, as asthma, they may not tolerate adenosine very well. So if you can avoid doing adenosine uh, by IFR, uh, then that's the way to go. It's a safer thing to do. And also, uh, it's also the cost issue, too. So adenosine, you know, it will have extra cost if you have to use it. You have to mix it in the cat lab, so it takes another probably five, ten minutes to prepare it. So you save all those basic things, and then it's safer for the patient. So if you do the IFR and it's negative, you are done. And if it's positive, you can go ahead and do your PCI. If you get a really borderline IFR, you know, sometimes if I get the IFR of 0.9, 0.9, I'm not really still completely sure, should I leave it alone or should I stand? then I'll obtain the FFR uh, to see which direction we will go, and usually that breaks the tide. But uh, again, we try to start with IFR nowadays uh, to begin with. And again, it has other benefits. Sometimes with adenosine, you get a level of fluctuation in the amount of uh, your FFR. Um, and also, the, another good value of IFR is you can do a pullback with your wire, pressure wire, meaning that you can uh, localize where the main lesion is uh, so you can treat the main lesion, especially if you are dealing with tandem lesions, multiple lesions in one artery. Now I'm going to talk about my last topic, which is intravascular imaging in the cath lab, something that also we have a big passion for it. I think in the contemporary cath labs, uh, if you don't consider inappropriate cases, of course, not in every case, to do some sort of intervascular imaging, you are not providing the full service to the patient, you know. And geography alone is pretty good in most cases, but there are cases that for a variety of reasons we'll touch base on, um, you know, you, can, you have to do intravascular ultrasound or um, optical coherent tomography, OCT, to really delineate the uh, vessel wall. You can see, you know, what are the composites of the vessel wall. This is the IBUS picture, high resolution IBUS. This is OCT picture. You know, what we learn in medical school, you know, in terms of the intima media adventitia, with OCT you can see it. I mean, it's so beautiful and um, informative also. So with IBUS image interpretation, you can, you know, see the fiber fatty, you know, plaque. You can see if there's a calcium, uh, this kind of dense, basically, um, object here. Uh, you can see if there's a red thrombus, you know, lots of, you know, fresh RBCs causing the thrombus, white thrombus, platelet-rich thrombus. And you can see if there was an old stent and if there's a tissue protrusion, like here, in the old stent. So really a lot of good information with the IVUS, um, which is just intervascular ultrasound. No contrast involved. Um, it's pretty simple to do. Just over the wire, you advance this camera, and then uh, it gets done. OCT, you have to basically use contrast to display the blood from the lumen of the vessel, and then you take, you have these nice, beautiful pictures with very high resolution. Uh, probably even sometimes easier to interpret as you have a higher resolution. Um, you know, again, fibrous plaque, you have the fiber fatty plaque here, you have calcium sitting in this corner, you have red thrombus here, you have white thrombus, and uh, you have some tissue protrusion in the old stent. And these, you know, shadows you see, these are behind the stent struts. So really, intravascular imaging can help in pre-intervention uh, when we are deploying the stent, and also post-intervention. Uh, and if there's any complication, we are worried about. So in, really, in all three steps of basically precutaneous core intervention, there's a good role for intravascular imaging. Let me give you an example about um, uh, using one of the cases also we had a few months ago. 
So a 77-year-old lady, hypertension, long-standing smoking history, came with non-ST elevation MI, uh, troponin of 1.2, normal EF on the echo, LDL high, creatinine almost normal. So this was her, you know, left system. Again, radial approach, taking picture of the left. No major disease in the left, you know, some moderate disease. But in the right, there's some disease up here in the Prax RCA, but there's something going on here in kind of mid-distal RCA. You know, some haziness, you know, some feeling defect of the contrast. In this other view, you don't see it very well, but you can see it in this view. Um, so you really don't know what it is, you know, even after this pictures and after this procedure, I showed it to a couple of my other colleagues, interventionalists. One said that, yeah, it might be a, uh, basically a thrombus. One said it could be a plaque uh, full of calcium, calcified plaque. You know, again, older lady, you know, prototype, maybe some calcium plaque. Um, and these are two very different type of plaques. You know, thrombus is one thing. If you have the amount of calcium like this, it's a totally different thing. If you have a significant calcification in the artery, you may not be able to uh, just balloon open the artery and then put your stent. You may need to use advanced devices like atrectomy devices, things that, you know, you know debulk the artery. Uh, we call it the drill, basically, the diamond tip drill that we use. So it's a totally different ball game if you have this much calcification. So what I did to see what's going on here was to put the wire down the artery and pass the uh, OCT camera. And then by doing that, you know, this is the pullback from that, uh, you know, OCD camera, and you see from the distal to proximal, um, this is coming back. So the white, um, you know, dot here is showing where things are uh, coming back in the picture here, kind of a longitudinal view, and this is your uh, basically horizontal cross-section view. And uh, here you have your lesion, and as we get to the lesion, uh, you will see in this uh, cross-section view, that what we saw in the angiogram, the feeling defect, was really a lot of thrombus. So it was a plaque that was ruptured, and you had a lot of thrombus. So it was basically thin cap fiber atroma that was ruptured and caused some thrombus. And otherwise, the vessel is pretty nice and smooth, not much calcification. Uh, and then when it comes back all the way uh, to more proximal section, we saw the narrowing that we see here that uh, could have been probably 40-50% is much more basically based on the OCT. So really now, the information I obtained from this OCT, even before doing an intervention, helped me to decide my stent and revascularization strategy. Usually when we put a stent, we first put the balloon uh, with no stent to open up the vessel, and then we deploy the stent. But here, I decided to directly place the stent because there was no calcification. I felt I can expand this stent nice and with no problem, so that's what we did. So we just delivered basically two stents, and then uh, use a, uh, basically an NC balloon, uh, which is non-compliant balloon, we call it, so nice and smooth, basically opens up the stent after we place it, and uh, this is the final result we got. And then we had another run of the OCT in this artery uh, to make sure the stent is nice, both of them are nice and open, and uh, everything is nice and smooth. And this is the OCT run. And again, uh, with the OCT, we can basically see um, the stent struts, as you see here. So these are the shadows behind the stent struts. We can even make measurement, make sure the stent is nice and open. We can see the edge of the stent, make sure there's no dissection. So a lot of good information just based on this. And people will say, you know, you do OCT, you have to use contrast and all that. But if you do and merge your uh, pictures with your OCT, you can be very minimalistic in the amount of contrast used. So this procedure from the beginning uh, that I poked the radial artery to the end took 62 minutes, and the total contrast used was 60 cc. Um, you know, the patient is doing fine and uh, went home next morning. It was late in the afternoon, otherwise I would do the same day discharge on her. But anyway, between the OCT and I, was, there are some differences, you know, where to use which one. I think that's a little bit more than the scope of this talk. But um, definitely, again, there's a role for either of them in many cases. So if you see a severe calcification like here, more than, you know, uh, <clears throat> basically uh, less than 270 degree is one thing. But if you see more than 270 degree of calcium is another thing. And so here, more likely, I need to think about using some sort of advanced device to drill through this artery first, basically, to open it up and then be able to deploy the stand. Versus here, probably because there's some room I don't need to do a, a trachectomy. 
And anybody who had instant stenosis, uh, this is the ISR that you may hear, uh, I think the, the O to the patient to do some sort of intravascular imaging to see what is the mechanism behind the ISR and uh, treat appropriately based on the mechanism. And, you know, doing these procedures in intravascular imaging is pretty safe. There are studies looking at this, and the event rate is pretty, pretty low, uh, really no significance um, uh, increase. Uh, of course, you have to know what you are doing. But unfortunately, in the U.S., we are not fully adapted to use them as liberally as uh, they are done, especially in Japan. And, um, you know, probably, you know, um, here at the U.S., you know, we are more in tune to do this intravascular imaging, but across the country, our fellows, you know, interventional cardiology fellows may not get enough training in the coronary physiology, IBIS, and OCT. So definitely it is something that needs to be changed. This is a survey based on TCT. So again, if we do angiographic only PCI, then we can say, you know, I think my result is great. But if you do an IBIS OCT guided PCI, you know uh, that your result is good or not. So because you can see it inside the artery. So having said that, you know, I want to conclude here. Really, Andre Gronzig started the field uh, now, you know, more than 40 years ago, but the field has um, come a long way from where it uh, was back there with plain old balloon angioplasty. Now we do a lot of different th uh, things and different toys that we have. And, um, and I just talked about the coronary intervention, but definitely the structure of world and peripheral is also pretty advanced nowadays. And thank you so much. Open to any questions. Applause in the audience from the few people to us. <laughs> thank you. So, you know, when you asked about grand rounds, I guess you said coronary intervention. I thought you said corona intervention. <laughs> so I, I misunderstood uh, the topic. Um, so if anybody in the audience has questions, any, anybody who has Doc Halo, they can Doc Halo Peter Sarek or Christian Wells with questions. Um, what do you think the next big breakthrough is going to be? Like, what do you see in five years? Because this field... You know, I'm, I guess I'm getting a lot of gray hair, but it's changed so much in my lifetime. It's so dramatic, the pace of change and the advance. Do you see any? I think coronary interventions, being honest with you, um, is, you know, as you said, is really advanced nowadays. Yeah. One thing that still is behind, again, across the U.S. is adaptation to all these contemporary techniques and tools that we have. I see a little bit of resistance. It's still like radial approach is not default in many places. Yeah. You know, using Slavaska imaging, using physiology, I think the more we have people who are more probably recently trained and all that, maybe that will change. Also, the issue with hemodynamic support. We are yeah. learning a lot. I didn't want to open the bag of shark and PCI, but hemodynamic support is a very evolving actually field. Sure. Um, and nowadays, uh, you know, I think in a few years, things may uh, start changing a little bit with the way we do basically anterior MIs and hemodynamic support. I think that changes will come through. Um, I hope one day we can get to the point that, you know, we can do core intervention with less amount of radiation sure. uh, for the safety and uh, benefit of everybody in the cat lab. But, again, these are all fine tunings that uh, I foresee will happen in the future. Awesome. I had a question for you, Dr. Forjande. Sure. So you touched a bit on radial approach and kind of the advantages there. I guess how widely has that been adopted kind of nationally and, and what percentage, I guess, are we doing here uh, for those approaches? I think if you ask, you know, different people from different centers, it's different, uh, but NCDR, I think it's at least about 50% now, you know, across the U.S. There are centers that are 90% plus that they're doing. But being honest with you, I still do some femoral cases. There are cases that you have to do femorally just because you have to use uh, bigger gears, you know, bigger guide catheters to do them. You need hemodynamic support to do them, for instance. So it's not that you have to do all the cases radially. I think it should be the default. But to me, the sweet zone is probably around 80% plus uh, B radio. Um, again, across the U.S. system, we have some, you know, variations in each hospital, uh, but there's a definitely a tendency toward actually becoming more radial. Interesting. Great. Thank you. Yeah. Are there any questions from our virtual audience? If so, we actually, we have one from, from, uh, from Dr. From Kramer our actual, here. Our actual audience. <laughs> Young Dr. Kramer. Um, so I know the ischemia trial is, um, you know, coming out. I haven't read it. But um, in terms of looking at, like, viable versus not viable, like, if you determine that it is viable, but then you go in and do an FFR, like, is there, what's the current understanding of, like, merging those two in terms of figuring out, like, what are the best lesions to reperfuse for myocardial viability? 
Yeah, I didn't want to go to the concept of um, ischemia and, you know, making the decision for the patient to come to the cath lab per se. Um, definitely there's value in uh, patients who are enrolled in ischemia trial and, you know, we are learning that, you know, some patients you can just continue with uh, medical therapy alone. Uh, but there has been a lot of, you know, different interpretation of those trials. Being honest with you, you know, when the trial was running, I was still back in Emory as a fellow and, you know, one of our center, our VA center, was one of the enrolling, actually, center for it. So people were very selective, basically, being honest with you, in enrolling patients in that trial. So, like, for the patient that they felt this patient, you know, has a lot of symptoms and, you know, they have a lot of ischemia and the nuclear test or whatnot, they would send them to cath lab, get them done. And more likely, the patients who were more on the moderate, basically, range were randomized. So that's a little bit of a, you know, washout that happened um, with that trial. So that's why, you know, I think we should, you know, learn from each trial, of course, but be a little bit cautious in terms of expanding all to every single patient. Um, to me, I think the most important thing, remember, with revascularization, either with PCI or bypass, you, your goal is, uh, is going to be one of the two. Either you are trying to improve the patient's survival, and that's when you are dealing with left main with three cell disease. You know, nobody can say if you fix a diagonal branch or OM branch, even if there are 99% of the nose, you are going to save somebody's life. That's, I don't think anybody is going to claim that. But the other aspect is patient uh, symptoms and quality of life. And quality of life for different people means different things. You know, if you say, okay, I can use three different anti-anginal and have somebody to be angina free and they do fine, I've had patients that are like, doc, I want to get rid of these medications. What was my option? And if you think that there's, you know, even one single vessel disease that is not a proxy AD, that is not significant like left main, and theoretically you can live alone with medications, but this patient wants to get their medication, then you can offer them PCI. So I think either you have to take into account quality of life, symptom improvement, or survival benefit. Um, the notion of PCI is it going to improve survival on anybody, that's not true. Great. Any questions from our remote audience? Again, you can dock Halo, or if you unmute, you can uh, ask us and we can hear you here. If not, um, I want to thank you for a nice antidote to the time of corona, corneria, and uh, <laughs> thanks very much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.